Okay, I've got my popcorn, my blanket, and my Archimedes stuffy to cuddle up with. I cannot wait to watch this show that Noah recommended. Zero to infinity on Nova. Zero what is all that racket? Can't a guy just watch TV in peace around here? Okay, guys, I need you to take all of these two-by-fours and get the rest of the room framed out before the electrical crew gets here. Okay, right on. Okay. Yeah, I, okay, I got you. Noah? Pete, whoa. You shouldn't be out here without a hard hat. Here, put this on. What the heck is going on out here? Let's head over to my trailer so we can talk. So, you want to tell me what's going on, and what's with this trailer? Okay, you may not believe this, but this all started with me just wanting to build a nice little birdhouse for the backyard. A birdhouse? There must be at least 20 people working out there. And it looks like they're adding a whole new wing onto the math club. Well, I had to do something with all the extra wood that was delivered. Extra wood? Why was any wood delivered? Oh, I ordered it from the lumber store. And I used these blueprints here to figure out how much to order, see? That's the birdhouse I wanted to build. And that's the total amount of wood we need. Okay, let me see if I follow this. It looks like you wanted 175 square inches for the floor and the roof. Yep, and that includes the perches for the birds and all the extra embellishments. Look, there's even a tidy little gazebo. Okay, and I see the four walls here. Each one is supposed to be 10 inches by 5 inches. Right. So the total amount of wood comes to 175 plus 10 times 5 times 4, which is 3,700. 3,700? That's right. See, 175 plus 10 is 185. I multiplied that by 5 to get 925, and I multiplied that by 4 to get 3,700. That's why I ordered 3,700 square inches of wood. I'm just not sure how the lumber store got the order wrong. Oh, the problem with your order is there's a problem with your order. You don't say. The problem with my order is that there's a problem with my order? What I mean is your order of operations. You added when you should have multiplied. Well, what difference could that make, Pete? I still added and multiplied all the same numbers, didn't I? You did, but when you do things in the wrong order, you can end up with a big wrong answer. See, here, you have to do the multiplication first. 10 times 5 times 4, which is 200. And then, when you add the 175, you get 375. Are you telling me I ordered... 3,700 square inches of wood when I only needed 375? That's about the size of it. You ordered almost 10 times more than you needed. Holy cow. No wonder I ended up with enough wood to build our new math cave. Math cave? Yeah. It's like a man cave, but it's for doing math. I figured that'd be a good way to use up all the extra wood since the lumber store has a no returns policy on delivery orders over 5,000 bucks. You spent... Five grand at the lumber store? You know what? That's okay. Mistakes happen. And besides, a math cave does sound pretty cool. Uh-oh. Sounds like I have to get back to supervising. This math cave isn't going to build itself, and you really got to stay on top of these guys. Okay. Well, is there anything I can do to help out? As a matter of fact, there is. Since I'm using all of the wood to build the math cave... Do you think you could run out and pick up a nice little birdhouse for the backyard? All right, so Pete, in preparation for this episode, I was doing some internet searching for information about the order of operations. And when I was doing this, I stumbled across one of these memes that are so popular on social media these days and so frustrating to me. Have you ever seen one of these, the ones where they have a picture and it has a problem that it asks you to solve and then everybody starts arguing about what the right answer is? Oh, yeah. It's like once every month, something on social media erupts 
like you're in a baseball stadium where the wave is going around and you're just waiting for it to come because in a couple of days, one of these memes is going to show up on Facebook or Twitter and everybody's going to be outraged. Exactly. So let me describe this one for you and for the listeners. It's a picture of a blackboard with tons of math written on it in the background and a kid looking at it with a very frustrated and confused look on his face. And then there's text overlaid over this image. And it says at the top, for real math nerds only, solve carefully. And then the problem is 230 minus 220 times one half. That's the whole thing. 230 minus 220 times one half. And then at the bottom, it says, most people won't believe it, but the answer is five. Okay, five. All right, five. And you know what's really frustrating about this to me is, one, I hate when they tell you most people will get this wrong before you've even looked at it. But I doubly hate when they tell you most people will get it wrong because the real answer is, and then they get it wrong. Because the answer here is not five. Well, this one, what you're describing actually sounds like it might be a joke, right? Like it might be a troll who's like, ha check out my little meme, you know, <laughs> because it's just dripping with problems. There's so much that's wrong about this one. So why don't you tell us one way to see that the answer might be five and then explain why that's incorrect and what is the answer? Okay, well, one of the things elementary school teachers really need to be able to do is to look at our students' mathematical mistakes and figure out where did they go wrong? You know, what did they do? And so in looking at this problem in that light, it's super obvious right off the bat what mistake one would have to make to get the answer five. And that would be just evaluating the expression left to right. So 230 minus 220 is 10 and then times one half. So 10 times one half is five. So if you just go left to right across the expression, you're going to get the answer five. But that's not the right answer if you're applying the order of operations correctly. It's kind of like you've gotten in the steamroller and you're just rolling from left to right, just beep, beep, beep. And you don't care what's in your way or what's coming up next because you're just going to do whatever the operation says. Exactly. And interestingly enough, this is the same kind of mistake that I made in our opening sketch when I was trying to order all that plywood. I just plowed right through from left to right without any concern at all for the correct order of doing the steps. Right, so there is an order of operations at play here, which we'll dive into a little more deeply in a moment, but why don't you solve the problem for us using the correct ordering? All right, so the correct way to do this would be to do the 220 times one half first. So 220 times one half is 110. Then you would do the subtraction problem 230 minus 110 is 120. So the correct answer here is actually not five, but 120. So Pete, before we go much further, let's do a little bit of background about order of operations, what it is and what the order is, just in case we have any listeners who aren't super familiar with the order of operations and how that works. Sure. So, you know, I remember back to the mid 2000s when I was teaching college and frequently would have students come up to me and say, you know, hey, Mr. Liddig or Mr. L or Big L, whatever. Hey, Mr. Cate, Mr. Cate. I, I don't understand PEMDAS. And I would say, well, that makes two of us. What the heck is PEMDAS? I mean, that sounds like a word that should never be spoken by human beings ever again. It just sounds wrong to me. And quickly I realized, oh, they're just using the acronym that I grew up saying as, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And the acronym P-E-M-D-A-S is intended to help us remember the order in which to apply operations when we have an expression like 230 minus 220 times one half. And so if we rely on the ordering that that acronym tells us, then we'll actually arrive at the correct answer. Okay. So now you mentioned a mnemonic device. Do you think we could real quick just go through what each of those letters stands for, starting with the P? Sure. When I'm looking at an expression like the one that we're discussing, my first step is to look for any parentheses. They'll be used to handle grouping of various numbers and symbols together. And in fact, I don't see any parentheses here, so I can move on. 
Okay. But before we move on, I just wanted to mention when I was teaching the order of operations in elementary school, the acronym was actually not PEMDAS, but it was GEMDAS. There was a G in place of the P. And that was because parentheses aren't the only type of grouping symbol that we sometimes see in a mathematical equation. You might also see brackets or other grouping symbols. And so the P was changed to a G to show that the first step is actually grouping, that you resolve any parts of the expression that are contained within grouping symbols, like parentheses or brackets. Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, sometimes our equations involve combinations of parentheses and brackets. Rather than having parenthesis, 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 it helps to break it up visually by introducing a bracket. And it's really just that. It's a visual distinction that allows you to nest things a little more deeply without getting lost in a sea of little parentheses, right? But we don't have any grouping symbols here, so we move on to the E, and please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, the E stands for exponentiation. Think X squared or 5 raised to the third power. We don't have any exponentiation here, so we can move on to the M. Well, let me ask you a quick question about exponentiation before we move on. Would that also include radical symbols? Like if I see something like the square root of 16, would I also evaluate that to be a 4 during the exponentiation stage? Yeah. Now, I think a beneficial way to think about square root symbols like that is to imagine them as the square root function. So rather than thinking only about the exponent being equal to a half, which is what it would be for square roots, you can think of them in terms of, oh, this is the square root function and I am plugging something into it. So I need to pay attention to the fact that everything that's inside that square root symbol needs to be evaluated before the exponent can because it's happening inside a function. And this kind of thinking extends to more complicated scenarios like perhaps the sine function shows up in what you're working with. You definitely need to pay attention to evaluating the arguments of those functions before you evaluate the function. Okay, so as you said, the example we're looking at right now doesn't have any grouping. It also doesn't have any exponents or radicals in it. So let's move on to the next part of our acronym. Right, and that's the letter M, closely followed by D, which we'll talk about in a moment. But M stands for multiplication. And in this particular problem, we do have a multiplication, right? It's 230 minus 220 times one half. So the very first operation that we need to perform here is the multiplication of 220 and one half. All right, that makes sense. But sometimes there will be more than one multiplication problem to do in the expression. Can you tell us how do you know what order to do those in? Well, if the expression has more than one multiplication symbol in it, or if the very closely related division symbol shows up, that's what the D stands for, then those operations need to be evaluated moving left to right in terms of the expression. Here, though, we only have a single multiplication, so there's really nothing to worry about. We can simply multiply 220 times one half, which, as you noted, is 110. Right. And then moving on from the M and the D, the A and the S, which come after them in the PEMDAS acronym, stand for addition and subtraction. They do. Now, when we get to the point that we have 230 minus 110, there's really nothing to do except subtract. However, prior to evaluating the multiplication and when first looking at the expression, we do see two operations. Subtraction occurs first in left to right order, but its precedence, its priority is lower than multiplication. So we defer it until after we have performed the multiplication. The same would be true for addition. If the problem were 230 plus 220 times one half, again, it would be 220 times a half is 110. And then we would add that to 230 to get 340. So I think that basically covers at least the extent of the order of operations for this expression. I can't help but think, why do we use the order determined by PEMDAS and not something more straightforward? Like, why not just say that the order is always left to right? It would be a lot simpler that way. So is there a reason we decided not to do it like that? You know, that's an interesting question. 
I'm sure math historians could tell us quite a bit about when and why certain conventions emerged and were preserved over time. I don't actually know how to answer your question from a historical point of view. I can think of one good reason, though, for not using a left or right convention, and it has to do with polynomials. Polynomials meaning expressions like 3x squared or x cubed plus x plus 1? Yeah, and in fact, 3x squared is a good example. If I asked you to evaluate 3x squared when x is 2, what would you get? Well, if x is equal to 2, then x squared is 4, so 3x squared is 12. Yep, and when you write 3x squared on a piece of paper or you see it in a textbook, it doesn't require any parentheses, right? No, I, I never really thought of that, but I guess it doesn't. You would just write a 3 and then an x where the x has a little superscriptive 2, meaning that it's being squared. Right, but you're using the usual order of operations there. You first squared 2 and then you multiplied it by 3. If we were using a left to right ordering, then 3x squared would equal 36 when x is 2. Oh, I see, because I'd have to first compute 3 times 2 to get 6 and then square that to get 36. So we'd need to use parentheses here if we wanted to get the usual answer of 12, wouldn't we? We would. And I'm going to tell you right now that no mathematician in their right mind is going to agree to write a 3 followed by an open parenthesis, then an x squared, and then a closing parenthesis. That would be a total deal breaker. Yeah, I can definitely see why that's much less convenient than just writing 3x squared. So would you say that at least in cases like this, our mathematical notation reinforces and supports the correct way of applying order of operations? Yeah, that's a fair question. And I want to challenge one of the words that you said, which is now that we have done it in the correct way. Of course, on the face of it, correct is the correct word. But it's important to note that the correctness is derived from a social convention, a set of invented rules more than on some underlying mathematical truth. So, for example, 12 divided by 3 is equal to 4. That's not convention that tells me that the answer is 4. It's mathematical fact that could be proven very rigorously. And, of course, kids all over the planet could tell us that, yes, 12 divided by 3 is 4. And they probably have many ways of demonstrating the truth of that fact. However, there is no way to demonstrate the correctness of first do the multiplication and then do the subtraction. That is simply an agreed upon convention where enough people in the room are nodding their heads to go, yep, that's how we're going to do it. All in favor say aye. Aye. That is, in fact, how we have learned to do it. And we call it correct, even though it really is just an agreement between people to communicate clearly and without ambiguity. Yeah, you know what this is reminding me of? And please jump in and tell me if this is the same sort of thing. It reminds me of when you're rounding numbers. And if you're rounding to the nearest 10, you look at the digit in the ones place. If it's zero through four, you round the tens place down. And if it's five through nine, you round the tens place up. Now, for zero through four and for six through nine, it's obvious because you're rounding to the place that's closer. But when it's exactly five, five's right in the middle. So that sort of seems to me like another one of those areas in mathematics where we just sort of had to agree on a way to do it because there's nothing that's more right about rounding a five up than rounding it down other than that's the agreement that mathematicians have made with each other. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good comparison. And I want to say that unlike order of operations, this probably is a little weaker in terms of the extent of its agreement, because there really are several possibilities. I can think of four possibilities, actually, off the top of my head. One possibility is you always round down. It doesn't matter how large the decimal is. You're just going down to the nearest whole number. Similarly, you could choose to always round up. So you always just drop the decimal point and add one to the integer part, and that's the result of your rounding. Or you could do a combination of the two by always rounding in the direction of zero. Rounding in the direction of zero? 
I don't think I've heard of that before. How does that work? Well, for numbers that are greater than zero, like 1.7, you would round down, in this case, to one. And for numbers that are less than zero, like negative 1.7, you would round up, so you'd get negative one. In both cases, you round in the direction of zero. Oh, so you're basically saying that instead of rounding to the nearest whole number, you'd round to the whole number that's closer to zero, right? Exactly. Now, looking at these rounding possibilities, you might say, yeah, but shouldn't we be more balanced? Like somehow we want to say we're looking for a method that on average kind of gets to the right whole number and does it in a way so that it kind of goes up as often as it goes down. Sure, we can definitely do that. Again, that's just a different scheme. And so I think what most mathematicians would do is ask, what scheme are we talking about here? Because each has its place, depending on the context. And of course, it's not just mathematicians who think about rounding schemes. Scientists use them all the time when working with significant figures and different programming languages use different rounding schemes and so on. Okay, so we've established that the order of operations is basically just a set of agreements, but I'm still wondering why did mathematicians feel the need to have a set of agreements around this? I'm wondering, is it because, like, for example, when I evaluated this example expression, we got two different answers based on the two different orders that we followed? It seems to me like a system of mathematics should not be able to lead to different answers for the same problem. What is your favorite color? Blue. No. Right. I think you've hit it right on the head. And we could have settled on a different convention, namely the one that says, hey, make no assumptions. We will always discuss upfront what our notational system means so that any reader who comes across our writings will be able to know right front and center what we mean when we write something like 230 minus 220 times one half. But imagine the burden that that would put on readers. Even if you achieved clarity of exposition by always expressing at the top of every paper that you wrote, here are my conventions. Think about the burden that would put on people. So it's much better to have a universal consensus if you can reach one so that everyone knows, ah, this is a mathematical expression. I know what I'm supposed to do because there are these rules, these conventions that tell me if I do this, I will get the same answer that everyone else gets who looks at this problem. I love that you said that we do this so that everybody knows the right order to do this in because it's kind of hilarious to me when you look at these posts that come up on social media, how much everybody does not know the order that you're supposed to do these in. <laughs> That's what leads to all of these debates and all of this arguing online when one of these comes up and you'll have people, you know, screaming at the top of their digital lungs about how everyone else is being stupid and that they're obviously the one that's doing it right when they've got the wrong answer. Never mind. Yeah, and there's another common pattern that you see, which is to say very few people will get this right. Only if your IQ is over 150 will you get this right. And then it's an arithmetic problem, like 6 divided by 2 <laughs> times 9 plus 11. It's just part of the internet rage machine, right? Like, we're all going to be upset about something, and it's pandas, pandas. I guess that's where we are. Yeah, I'm going to share another example. This one is slightly different, but I saw this in a teacher's group on Facebook recently, and someone had posted the problem, and listeners, you might want to write this down so that you can see it. It was 8 plus 8, and then there was, you know, the slash that stands for a division bar when you're typing. So it was 8 plus 8 slash or divided by 2 times the quantity in parentheses 6 minus 4. And he went on to say that the correct answer was 10. Now, when I followed the order of operations, the way that we just explained it, I did not get an answer that was 10. I got 16. I'm not going to go through all the calculations right now. I think that might be boring for the listeners. But what was interesting was when I asked him why he thought it was 10 instead of 16, his answer really focused around that slash standing for the division symbol. 
I thought that that slash just went over the two, but he said that that slash went over everything that came after it in the expression. So that there was really another implied set of parentheses around that entire denominator. This didn't sit well with me because that's why I thought we had parentheses to make it explicit and obvious. I didn't think you could have an implied pair of parentheses. You know what I mean, Pete? Yeah, and I suppose I would take issue with the claim that the slash has a special rule that there are these sneaky parentheses that are there and you're just supposed to know about them. Pretty sneaky, sis. I guess it's possible that people use this so-called rule as a convention, but here, let me give you an example to show you the issue I have. How would this rule about the slash apply to an expression like 18 slash 6 slash 2. The slash rule seems to imply that we're supposed to compute 18 divided by 6 halves, which is 18 divided by 3 or 6. If we follow the ordinary PEMDAS rule, though, which in this case would amount to evaluating the expression from left to right, we'd have 18 sixths divided by 2, which is 3 halves. So my question is, how do you know how far those sneaky parentheses are supposed to go? Yeah, I see what you mean. If this was written with a horizontal fraction bar with the numerator on top and the denominator on bottom instead of a slash, there'd be no doubt which way it was meant to be evaluated, which I guess kind of does mean that sometimes there are a sort of implied parentheses. Whenever you see an expression in the numerator or denominator of a fraction, it's it's just understood that it's a complete unit that you need to evaluate as if it had parentheses around it. Yeah, and you know, here's my advice. And this is something I do in my own work. And it's something that I used to tell students all the time. If there's any chance for ambiguity, clarify it. Put the parentheses in explicitly. There's absolutely nothing preventing you from correctly using parentheses. So rather than relying on these two sneaky guys that are there but not there, why not just clear the air and put them in? Yeah, that makes a lot more sense to me than just leaving them out and then stating that they're implied. Yeah, now, having said that, I'm going to say something which might at first appear to be contradictory, which is there are cases where we rely on implied parentheses, in other words, an implied grouping order, but in those cases, there's no danger of ambiguity. Let me give you an example. So, Noah, can you tell me what is 2 plus 5 plus 1? 2 plus 5 plus 1 would be 8. Okay. How did you get it? I did 2 plus 5 and got 7, and then I added one more and got 8. Interesting, because what I did was I did 5 plus 1 and got 6, and then did 2 plus 6 and got 8. All right. Well, that makes sense, because it sounds like what we're dealing with here is the associative property of addition. That's right. Addition is associative, and we just illustrated the two different ways to group an expression involving three terms, and we got the same answer. That's true for multiplication as well. It is also associative. However, not every operation is. Right. Like if we were doing 10 minus 3 minus 2, we would get a different answer. If we did 10 minus 3 first and got 7 and then subtracted 2, we would have 5. But if instead, we did 10 minus 3 minus 2 by doing the 3 minus 2 first to get a 1. 10 minus 1 is 9. So we're getting different answers there. Right. And so the way we handle that situation is with our order of operations rule. So please excuse my dear Aunt Sally tells us that, well, we should do subtraction first. That's the only symbol that appears here. And when more than one appears, we need to evaluate from left to right. So in this particular case, it would be 10 minus 3, which is 7, minus 2, which is 5. And if for some reason the problem that we were trying to get people to solve required them to do the 3 minus 2 first, then we would have to place some parentheses around the 3 minus 2 to indicate do this first. Exactly. And all these operations that we're talking about here are so-called binary operations. In other words, they expect to input numbers and then perform some operation and an output number is produced. So when I give you a problem like 2 plus 5 plus 1, 
some choice has to be made because addition only works on two numbers at once. So I have to decide, should I do 2 plus 5 first or should I do 5 plus 1 first? But again, because of the associative property, we don't need to worry about any ambiguity. Got it. And since subtraction isn't associative, when we're subtracting, we need to use grouping symbols or else rely on a convention to make sure there's no ambiguity. Yeah, that's right. Now, with subtraction, we do have an interesting alternative. Every subtraction problem can be rewritten in terms of addition. For example, our problem, 10 minus 3 minus 2, can be rewritten as 10 plus negative 3 plus negative 2. And now we can use the associative property because everything is written in terms of addition. Oh, right. So if I do 10 plus negative 3 first, I get 7. And then if I add negative 2, I get 5. On the other hand, if I do negative 3 plus negative 2 first, I get negative 5. And 10 plus negative 5 is also 5. So the answers agree. Of course, we'd still probably use parentheses when writing it out this way, right? Because you wouldn't just write 10 plus negative 3 as 10 plus symbol minus symbol 3. You'd probably write it as 10 plus and then put the negative 3 in parentheses, right? Just like you were saying earlier about putting them in there for clarity's sake. That's right. I think it's a lot clearer with the parentheses in place. Now, let me say one last thing. This connection between subtraction and the addition of negatives, this is essentially the reason we treat addition and subtraction as having the same priority in PEMDAS. Subtraction is just addition in disguise. And that must be the same with multiplication and division, right? Division is just multiplying by the reciprocal, which means division is multiplication in disguise. Yep, same exact thing. So since those are interchangeable, instead of please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, we could go with please excuse Dolly, my second aunt. You know, something that I think is interesting about this PEMDAS viral phenomenon is that when some problem like the kind we're discussing, only a genius would get this right and then it's a little arithmetic problem. Many mathematicians roll their eyes, they do a face palm, they sigh out loud within earshot of anybody that can hear. And I have a slightly different response. I do all of those things, the face palm and the sighing and the eye rolling. But there's also one other thing that is worth mentioning, which is this conversation shines a light on the socially constructed nature of mathematics. So it's not the case that everything about mathematics is this objective reality that underpins the entire universe. Some things that we do on a regular basis have resulted from social convention. And it reminds us that, oh, by the way, mathematics is something that humans do. Whether or not any other intelligent life forms do mathematics or not, we have no real direct evidence of anything. But we do know humans do it. And I like to remind folks that PEMDAS is a doorway into that conversation that can be enlightening. Yes, there's order of operations, and it's important to clarify what symbols mean and so forth. But there's this other opportunity to discuss the social reality of mathematics. I think it's really interesting, Pete, that you are taking the social from social media and showing how that can be applied to a mathematical conversation that's happening on social media. Like I have long thought whenever I've read any of these memes or looked at any of these problems, the ones that you say cause mathematicians to roll their eyes, I've often had the feeling that, man, this is probably contributing to the problem of some people out there just feeling like I don't get math and I'm just not a math person because they see something like this that says, most people won't get it, but the answer here is five. And they don't get five. But instead of thinking, ah, this person who posted this was wrong, they think, ah, I guess I just don't get it. That's a really good point. I hadn't quite thought of the fact that this can play into people's bad feelings about mathematics. Maybe somebody has struggled, you know, somebody who has had 
a number of negative experiences around mathematics, whether it was a teacher that wasn't particularly kind or it was a peer that said, boy, you're a real dum-dum. Whatever the case may be, this certainly can fuel that negative thought pattern, which I think is very unfortunate. I completely agree. And every time I see one of these, I can't help but try to solve it in my head and then make a determination about what was the goal of the person who posted this? Were they trying to really be supportive? Were they trying to be challenging? Were they trying to be somewhat malicious and maybe even a bit destructive towards the people that are going to be reading this post? And unfortunately, I think sometimes it's that latter kind of motivation that I think is really shining through. Yeah, the meme that you were discussing at the beginning of the show, it just has the ring of being some troll sitting, you know, behind the anonymity of the internet and just kind of going, <laughs> I'm going to send this out. <laughs> and like, it's just, just so chaos. I mean, the discussion of PEMDAS and all of the crazy viral memes that spin around it is just mind boggling. Sometimes I think, how, how did we get to this place? I mean, it would be akin to in the world of English, seeing memes about I before E except after C. And then there's a word like concierge and you're like, see, it's not I before E always because there's this other. And it's like, this is going to cause outrage on the internet, I guess. Yeah. But you're making me think of another question now. So as I said, when I see one of these memes, I can't help but solve it in my head because I know the correct order of operations. But I'm wondering, is the order that I think I know always the correct order of operations? Over the past year or so since we started the podcast, you have opened my eyes time and again to some areas of advanced math where things just don't work the way that they do in the more basic levels of math. So I guess what I'm wondering is, are there any branches of advanced mathematics where the order of operations is different from PEMDAS? Well, I think there are a number of interesting examples, perhaps not where PEMDAS itself is violated. It's more that there are operations that behave unlike the ordinary associative and commutative operations that we know so well. So, for example, the associative property that we spoke of a few minutes ago, that terminology comes from Hamilton, who you may remember from our very famous episode about imagining numbers. Hamilton was looking to extend physical calculations into three dimensions, which it turned out couldn't be done. And that's when he discovered the four-dimensional world of the Quaternions, right? You remember he carved that formula on the bridge in Ireland? Right, when he was on a walk with his wife, I remember discussing that. Yeah, and so Hamilton's work on the Quaternions inspired a friend of his named John Graves, who discovered an eight-dimensional system of numbers called the Octonians. Evil! And those numbers aren't even associative. In fact, this is what led Hamilton to invent the term associative property because he now had an example, thanks to Graves, of a system in which associativity does not hold. A weaker property does hold. We say that multiplication is alternative, which as all of us kids from the 80s and 90s know means Depeche Mode or The Cure or The Smiths. But in the setting of the Octonians, parentheses become crucial. You absolutely have to use them to signify the order in which multiplication takes place. That makes sense. Do you have any other examples to share? Yeah, we don't need to go as far out as eight dimensions to come up with an example that illustrates the non-associativity of multiplication. Students of physics and calculus have undoubtedly encountered something called the cross product, which provides a mechanism for multiplying two three-dimensional vectors together. And maybe you've heard know of the right hand rule, which tells you a certain way to wrap your fingers and hands in space when trying to solve a problem involving the cross product. So this is a very real example that is absolutely crucial to modern physics and mathematics for that matter in which multiplication is non-associative. And so 
we are forced to use some grouping symbols when working with this kind of multiplication. Well, while I can't say that I totally understand all of the mathematics that you're describing right now, I'm fascinated by how it has to work. And I am grateful that we have an order of operations to help us through all of this. Me too. As much ire and angst that PEMDAS generates in the world of the internet these days, it's a really good thing that we have a convention that we can all rely on. This allows people from all over the world, of all different ages, of all different occupations, a way to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to talking about numbers. Yeah, and that really is super important because you can see how if two different people are doing the same problem and getting two different answers, but they're working on some kind of important project, like let's say the guidance system of the International Space Station, that could lead to some pretty tragic results <laughs> if one person gets five for this answer while another person gets nine for the same problem. Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, that's a really good point. Sometimes the reason we need to communicate clearly is because if we don't, the consequences can be catastrophic. So Pete, thank you once again for a thoroughly educational conversation, this time about order of operations. In case any of our listeners want to try to stump us with a intentionally misleading and mischievous PEMDAS problem, how can they reach out to us to share such a dastardly meme? Well, probably the best place to do it would be to send us a tweet. Our Twitter handle is at Math Club Podcast. Beware if you send us one of these memes, there will be lots of face palms and eye rolls and all kinds of emojis going around. You can also take a less memeified approach and leave us a voice message at our SpeakPipe page speakpipe.com slash math club podcast and you can try to stump us through email our email address is math club podcast at gmail.com sounds fantastic and we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this math club pete i've got to get going speaking of order of operations i have to go order some dinner so i think it's time to wrap this one up okay that sounds fine but here's a parting thought i'm a mathematician and i don't even have an aunt sally well, then I guess we won't have to excuse her. We'll see you next time, Math Club. Happy summer, Math Club. Bye.